Our existence is frail. There are a million different ways us humans could go extinct. Could it be natural disasters, nuclear war, or even climate change? From what I've learned, technology is being pushed further and further to the point that it has become both our biggest existential threat as well as our key to immortality, and I think you will agree as well. This is called transhumanism, but we need to understand what exactly this is. Just like I said, when technology becomes more and more advanced, we solve more and more problems with it. But what if we could solve problems such as diseases or other impairments, change our genetic code and become superhumans? Because as humans, even going as far back as the Epic of Gilgamesh, where King Gilgamesh went on a quest for physical immortality, we've always had a burning desire to become something greater and push beyond our natural limitations. Before contemporary times, however, when the only way to improve our conditions was through magic or through the gods, there was a start to what would become transhumanist thought, dodging death by any means. Human desire to acquire new capacities is as ancient as our species itself. We have always sought to expand our boundaries of our existence, be it socially, geographically or mentally. Ceremonial burial and preserved fragments of religious writings show that prehistoric humans were disturbed by the death of their loved ones, and even though the belief in an afterlife was common, this didn't stop people from trying to extend their life on Earth. Prometheus in Greek mythology stole fire from Zeus and gave it to humans, thereby permanently improving the human condition, yet for this act he was severely punished by Zeus. The origins of modern transhumanism, that is, not through myth, fiction or occultism would be Nikolai Fyodorov's take on Russian cosmism, a movement that emerged in Russia which advocated for physical immortality, space exploration and resurrecting the dead through science. This was still very early, around the late 1800s and early 1900s, but Fyodorov still predicted that things such as extending life through technology, prosthesis replacing parts of the human body and space exploration would become parts of the future. By the early 1900s, most of modern futurism was already established. Thanks to Jules Verne, space exploration was considered to be a hot topic among futurists as far back as the late 1800s. The new ideal of a highly mechanized society, including us humans being mechanized, was established earlier than we think. During the mid-1900s, the possibilities of using technology to directly alter the human body became more and more mainstream. These were later known as proto-transhumanists. Fast forward to 1957, Julian Huxley was the one who gave us the term transhumanist. This was an exciting time to be a futurist. The first satellite, Sputnik 1, was launched and there was massive hype, you could say, about what other amazing advancements would happen in the coming years. But the technology just wasn't there to match this hype. Looking back, could feel a sense of pity for the people that thought they were much further along than they were. But this hope for the future was really important for the development of transhumanism as a philosophy. But still, people expected too much from the short term, believing that we could achieve human-level AI with the computers they had back then, and that their children or grandchildren would grow up with cybernetic parts. But the early transhumanists of the 1900s, the proto-transhumanists I mentioned, were doomed by time. It's strange to think that even if you believed wholeheartedly in future progress and dedicated your life to bring them about, if you were in your 20s in 1919, you were simply not going to live long enough to see the truly amazing things that technology would bring. Today, there are two major factions within transhumanist thought. The first being extropianism. It's a fusion between being optimistic about radical technology and the political philosophy of libertarianism. In short, it's libertarian transhumanism. Founded by Max Moore in the 80s, who lived in California and was heavily influenced by the growing anarcho-capitalist movement at the time. From this, his ideology formed, with focus being on min-maxing the human body with the help of technology. The goal being, of course, to live forever. But this wasn't the most inclusive philosophy, with the idea being that people who had the means to become superhuman would be able to, whilst others were left in the dust. The more democratic and perhaps inclusive way to think about transhumanism is what the World Transhumanist Association wanted to bring forward. Nick Bostrom wanted an inclusive platform for transhumanist ideas, arguing that other forms of this wasn't academically respectable and thoughts such as extropianism had cultish aspects. 
They made a document, the Transhumanist Declaration, which argued that the well-being of all humans was what actually could be achieved with technology. This is not to say that one side is right or wrong. Both have their arguments, and some would say that the vision of the World Transhumanist Association isn't a realistic vision for the future. So we know the different sides, but what actual things would transhumanism do to help our society? There is one factor that has immense potential. Genetic therapy. Imagine if you're going to have a baby. You would want your baby to have the best possible prospects for health, abilities and intelligence. What genetic therapy aims to do is self-explanatory. By using technology to modify the genetic material of our cells, we can change the outcome of a person being born. There are three methods already being used today. Gene replacement therapy is an approach where you take a healthy copy of a gene into the body to replace or even compensate for a bad gene. Gene editing allows scientists to make precise edits to the DNA in a living person, which can correct specific mutations and diseases directly. And gene silencing targets and silences genes that are functioning improperly, used for diseases like Huntington's disease. This all sounds pretty cool, things straight out of a sci-fi movie. And if this is possible today, imagine what could be done in the future. Julian Huxley argued against this. He drew a picture of a future where technologies like artificial wombs were used, not to make anything better for humanity, but to enforce an even stronger class system and eradicate individuality, monogamy, and the very essence of human freedom and dignity. If our genes were modified in the womb so that we would be perfect, there would be no sense of individuality anymore. No one would be unique. This is what a lot of people miss when talking about all the good sides of transhumanism. Bioludites, from the term luddites, are generally against technology, but bioludites are particularly against biotechnology that transhumanists argue for. They believe that a genetic caste system could be created. If the technology was only available to the people who had money, only the poor would be sick. Miles behind the richer, genetically modified superhumans who would be better in every way. Society isn't equal today, and they believe that with genetic enhancements it would become much, much worse. One argument that they proposed is a bit more on the emotional side in my opinion. Bioludites think that technology could undermine our human nature and the natural state that we're all born with. I guess it ties in with the fact that genetic modification would lead to less uniqueness in the world, but I'm not sure if that's a good or a bad thing. The main point is, at least, that we should slow down. But the rapid technological advancement is definitely not slowing down, whether we like it or not. Just look at the advancements in AI in just two years, and the new, slightly dystopian, Apple Vision Pro headset. These gives us a glimpse of how we can extend reality and human capabilities. Even though we might not have it in our generation, it's strange to think that we're actually at such a point where we're having debates about curing death. Even if the technology required isn't there yet, Things are developing so rapidly and chaotically that no one can say with 100% certainty that we won't still lack the technology 100, 50, 30 or even 20 years from now. This has never been the case before in human history. At no point in our 200,000 plus year history as a species have we ever been able to say we will cure death and actually have a means of doing so. Although we have always wanted to find a way to live forever, before now, it's always been through magical means, such as the Fountain of Youth, getting the favor of the gods, dealing with the devil or reincarnation. These were our means of attaining physical immortality. And as far as we know, none of these have ever worked. 